Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to be kicking the chicken as the guys get started on what's going to be one mean Pontiac. We'll pick it up and then strap it to the dyno and do a tune-up before we build it. All this for a Trans Am that we're going to be giving away to one of you guys. Plus, we talked to Burt Reynolds himself about what made these cars so iconic. Detroit Muscle starts right now. Glad to see you guys joining us. This is our new V8 powered high octane rear wheel drive how to show and we're calling it Detroit Muscle. Yeah, here's the deal. We're going to be revisiting and rebuilding some of your favorite American hot rods and muscle cars. Shoot anything that came out of Detroit back in the day that had some punch to it. And on top of that, we're going to be hitting on some of the rides that are part of the new muscle car era. Big power is back. We're going to take some of these awesome rides and make them even meaner. Yeah, Tom, but we got a problem. Except for a lot of tools, this shop is empty. So we got to get busy and get out and find our first project. So coming out of the gate, we wanted to put our back into it. We wanted to pick a car that was iconic, cool, and something you guys could relate to. Think you're gonna like what we picked. We knew it had to be something significant. Why? Well, because this first project is going to be given away to one of you guys. I've owned this car since 1986. What, 27, 28 years? My husband actually bought this car for me for my 29th birthday. He loves me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no mistaking one of these birds when you see them. Chicken on the hood, shaker to go with it, honeycomb grill and Pontiac emblems. You sure know a Trans Am when you see one. And it all started right here with the 60s phenomenon called Trans Am racing. This was the American muscle answer to European circuits. And there's a 69 Trans Am right there. This style of racing was known to be dominated by the pony cars, Mustangs, Camaros, Cudas, and of course, the Trans Ams. But then in 1977, Burt Reynolds and Sally Field went on the run from Sheriff Buford T. Justice in Smokey and the Bandit. We do love Burt Reynolds and we love the shows. And after I seen that black car, I wanted one, but I wanted red. That one movie created a phenomenon which still resonates to this day. It's hard not to look cool in this Pontiac pony car, which lies on the borderline between gaudy and downright aggressive. This particular car has been garaged for a long time. The old Pontiac 400 has a few squeals in it. But after we get done with it, it'll be making a whole lot more noise than that. Now, a very common thing to do is to take a used car for a test drive. I sweet talk the owner out of the keys, so we're gonna carry this thing down the road. One of the great things about these cars is they were legitimate contenders when it came to handling. The Trans Am was a sport-tuned upgrade over the Firebirds. Think of it like a Z28 to a Camaro. No doubt it's a fun car to drive. This particular car really feels like it's at home on the highway and it cruises as smooth as glass. Oh, once it's laid out. Hey, is that Jerry Reed? All in all, this is a quality car, which is gonna be a great foundation for us to build on. Really, I'm gonna miss it. I'm very sad to see this car go, but somebody needs to take it and keep it up because it's just been sitting in the garage and it's time to get it out on the road. It's very much like a member of the family. I'm letting go of it. We figured before we started twisting bolts off this old Pontiac and taking it apart, would poke it on the chassis dyno. As a matter of science, of course. Mike Galley from our sister show, Engine Power, is gonna lend us his time and his shop for a little bit. So we can see just how many horses are hiding inside that Trans Am. Well, alrighty, we've got the Trans Am strapped on the dyno. We're gonna make us a pull, cause we kinda wanna figure out what our baseline is. Now the engine, drivetrain and all that, we're gonna upgrade it, but we're just kinda doing this for grins. 
because we want to see what kind of power this thing's really making and we may do a little tweaking on it just to see what we can get out of it. Don't break her. <laughs> I have to say, you just blew the soot out of it. Oh my gosh! So how much power did it make? Coming up, we'll see how the old Red Dragon did on the rollers, and then see what else we can squeeze out of it. Plus, we take a look at a sleek, modernized supercar version of these classic Pontiacs. Welcome back. In case you missed it, today we're doing our best bandit impersonation. Our newest project car is this bright red 78 Trans Am. We're gonna slap it on the dyno and see what kind of a baseline we can get out of that 400 inch Pontiac engine. Oh my gosh! And boy, was it a ground pounder. That's right, 110 horsepower. But it's not surprising. By this point in the late 70s, Congress had had enough of the smoggy, smoky cars of the previous generation. And the muscle car era, well, it was dead and buried. Emissions restrictions had killed the asphalt melting big blocks of years prior, and even high performance cars like this TA were underpowered to say the least. Try 220 horsepower at 4,000 RPM at the flywheel. Factor in parasitic loss from the drivetrain and the additional 40,000 miles on this engine's rebuild, well, 110 ponies actually sounds about right. 122 that time. 122. Yeah. The lady who owned it, I don't believe she abused it any. So um, I know this thing could probably use a tune-up. Probably even taking the air filter off this thing. You do a big deal. How Wake old's the air filter? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Is that yeah. dyno fan on? Yeah, it's on. Oh, this is ain't nothing. I ain't kidding. It was a black cloud behind you earlier. Go ahead and pull another and let's see what it does. Still, we're gonna try to blow the cobwebs out and see if she'll wake up a little. At the very least, we're hoping to break up 130 for a nice solid baseline before we tinker with the engine. One thirty-six, two twenty-five. We broke. We broke our one thirty. Yeah, that's kind of not that impressive, is it? One way to look at it. Lots of room for improvement. So we picked up some tune-up parts from Summit Racing in hopes of waking it up. We're going to start out with some E3 spark plugs with Diamond Fire technology, which should pick up on the power. And if we were going to keep driving this car, it would also help us out with lowering emissions and improving fuel mileage. While we're at it, we'll also pull off the fuel filter. You can see it had some blockage. So a new one is a low cost investment that can go a long way. A good set of spark plug wires will help out too. The ones we pulled off this car were pretty ratty. And a couple were even taped up where the insulation had cracked off. With the new air filter in place, we can now see what she'll do. Thing is, this time it smoked so much, it might remind you of an old steam locomotive. My facial expressions is like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lordy. Well, I think the carburetor's running a little bit rich. <laughs> a vacuum gauge hooked up to the carb will tell you how to adjust your air fuel mixture screws. It's pretty simple. Just try to get the maximum amount of vacuum out of each side to get the optimal mixture. Yeah, you can tell it was a little bit fat. I adjusted the front idle mixture screws. They were about four turns out too far. So we're gonna see what that does. We 
made about right. 16 extra. That's not too bad considering this old thing could probably use that tune up anyhow. So I don't see as much black smoke back yeah, there. Yes, not nearly as much, and you know that's gonna save us some money at the fill up, which this thing is probably gonna have a few of them. So. That it will. I'm done. I'm gonna go wash my hands now. You know, cause... but I, I noticed something though, Gally. Y'all check this out. There's something about a camo hat and a red Trans Am. It just goes together. It's the beard. It is the beard. Come on, let's go. Stick around and see what the man himself has to say about these cars. It's beautiful. Hey, welcome back. You know, when Pontiac redesigned the Trans Am in 1977, the result was a state-of-the-art statement to the world. One that said, hey, look at me, let's go for a ride. Well, cars and taste have evolved quite a bit since then. Heck, it's been almost 40 years. So the question is, what happens when you take a classic icon and rethink it for the modern age? Detroit Muscle salutes the Bandit Trans Am. When a car becomes the centerpiece of a movie or TV show, it becomes the co-star. James Bond and the DB5. The Duke Boys and the General Lee and Burt Reynolds and his Firebird Trans Am. It's the car that jump-started Pontiac in 1977. Sales increased by 20,000 units that year. And it had a lot to do with Smokey and the Bandit. I've always said it was sexy. Golly, that's a sexy car. So it's just got the right lines and it's Kevin cool. King should know. As president of year one, he's made a business out of resurrecting dreams by distributing and manufacturing hard-to-find classic parts and restoring iconic muscle. One of their latest creations, the Bandit Trans Am. All we wanted to do was try some modern makeup. You know, we'll flush them out the windows, we'll build bigger wheels and tires, give the interior a little upgrade, put a new modern motor in it, better handling suspension, and turn an otherwise already gorgeous car into a supercar. And that's exactly what we did. A supercar for a superstar. When approached, the legendary Burt Reynolds himself signed on as a consultant. And at his ranch in Jupiter, Florida. Look at that. Honey, hush. Bert took delivery of the prototype he helped design. Wow. Well, changes per your request. It's beautiful. I'm under arrest before I even start driving. I've had many people pull up beside me now and not such good shape, 70 something, just like the bandit car. And they go, it's your fault. I said, I'm sorry, partner. But I bet you had a good time. He said, no, nah, I did. All of them had a great time that ever had this car. What's it mean to you? What's the... Well, I mean, there's just a flood of memories that come over me when I see this car. But when I saw the first one, it was... This is the first time Jerry Reed had seen it, too, and uh, God love him. He said, honey, hush. It wasn't in the script. And then we both just... were jumping all around it, you know, and then he got in it. And uh, it was a rush, you know, to, to drive that car. The original 77 Special Edition featured a 400 cubic inch 6.6 .6 liter V8. 200 horsepower to the rear wheels would get you down the quarter mile in 16 seconds. An LS7 out of a Z06 Corvette powers this bird. Under the black skin, the Burt Reynolds Edition is upgraded in every way, with modified heads and an upgraded cam pushing 605 horsepower. Full tubular subframe coilovers in the front, adjustable rear four link. Modernize this muscle in every way. But beyond the mechanics, gauges, seats, and of course the endorsement, this T-top trans was left alone. The smooth body lines remain, along with the honeycomb grille. The four square headlights are gone. In its place, modern sealed units with bright LEDs for taillights. No doubt, one cool car with one of the coolest cats again behind the wheel. Both from a 36-year-old movie that's still a hoot to watch. What makes audiences like that film, the reason it's had such an afterlife, is that you're watching people have the time of their life and they're not faking it. That picture was, was never worked to me. I mean, it was just, just fun. 
Well, you had your best pal in the movie. You got a great dog. Yeah. You got a great woman, and you got this car. Yeah, well, it don't get no better than that, does it? I mean. Uh -huh. Come on, Bert, why don't you do a burnout? Now, in case you're wondering, yes, you can order one of those cars from year one, or you can get the parts and mix and match them, build a bird just the way you like it. So what kind of upgrades are going on the giveaway TA? Let's go over it and see what she needs. Well, folks, we've got our big bad bird into our shop because time to start scheming about what kind of upgrades we're going to throw at this car. We are going to keep it all Pontiac, though, so first order of business is talk to the best Pontiac power guys we know at Butler Performance down in Leoma, Tennessee. Now, we're thinking with a stroker kit and borne out the cylinders, we can get this thing above the 460-inch range. When it's all said and done, we're going to be in the neighborhood of 500 ponies, and we're going to have to upgrade the rest of the car to make sure it can withstand that kind of power. That's going to include the transmission, the drive shaft, and that little old 10 bolt. We want to give the suspension some love too. Take these 30 plus year old components and upgrade it with the modern technology that's out there. Another thing we got in store for this car, of course, is paint. Now you may be wondering, are we going to keep this Pontiac dressed in red? Well, the previous owner may have loved it, but as for us, we're sold on black and gold. This car has a paint code of 19 on it, the Starlight Black, but it's missing the code of Y82 or 84, giving it the gold accent stripes of the special edition cars. It also missing the T-tops. But when we're all said and done with this car, it's gonna have the look and feel of those special cars from back in the day, but with a whole lot more attitude. You may also be interested to know that there was a Y88 special edition for 1978 only. It was a reverse color scheme, gold with black accents. So when we're done, the plan is to have this thing looking like something Burt Reynolds would drive, but uh, handling and going like something that Mario Andretti would drive. I think it's going to be nice. I bet you. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to get our stroke on. It's Pontiac Power Plant Palooza as we dump the doggy 400 inch engine in our giveaway Trans Am in favor of 550 horsepower worth of stroked and bored fury. With unmistakable lines and an iconic legacy, the 77 and 78 Trans Ams were among the most beloved pony car platforms ever built. Thanks in no small part to Burt Reynolds and Jackie Gleason. But Burt isn't going to be driving this one. One of you guys are, because we're giving it away. The plans that we have for the old Red Dragon include a change of skin, giving it the iconic black and gold special edition look. In addition to that, all the performance specs on this car are going through the roof. Everything from the rear end to the radiator is going to get an upgrade. And that includes a power plant. Now, we were able to sneak our old car up onto the chassis dyno, do a little bit of tweaking, and getting about 150 horse out of it. And I tell you, it's not too impressive at all. Got that right. Well, today is engine day for this old bird, and the plans Tommy and I have include giving it quite a power boost. Try over 300% of what it had before. Well, time to start tinkering on this Tribute Trans Am. Now, when it comes to Pontiac Performance, we knew exactly who to call. I want you guys to meet Rodney and David Butler with Butler Performance out of Leoma, Tennessee. How are you guys doing? Good, great to be here and look forward to working with you guys again. Just in case you guys haven't heard of Butler Performance, let us introduce you to them. If there's one name that's synonymous with Pontiac power, it's the guys at Butler Performance known across the world as the go-to gurus for Pontiac engine build, working up anything from a factory restoration to high-end drag racing motors. We've used them before on several builds and are never disappointed in the power and reliability they can build into one of these light blue blocks. So now that you know who these guys are, let's get down to the important stuff. David, what'd you bring for us to play with? We brought a Pontiac 455 block to replace the tired 400 that was in the Trans Am. Mm -hmm. Uh, the good thing about a Pontiac engine, there are no big block or small blocks. They're all the same size, so the 455 is a direct bolt in where the 400 was. So how does a guy know he's got a 455? First, in the valley, you'll have two fives if it's a 455. If it's a 400, you'll have two zeros here. Okay. Also, on the driver's side, you'll see the engine size cast right into the side of the block. Okay, what about your machine work? 
Well, we went with a 60 over bore, did a bore and hone with a torque plate, which is really critical on the Pontiac engine. We also square decked the block. As far as the bottom end goes, we replaced the factory dial pins to locate the main caps, replaced the stock bolts with ARP main studs, then we line honed the mains. Well, I know the 78 Trans M came with a 400 inch block. Using it instead of a 455, what would you need to look for? When using a 400, the main thing you want to look for is a thick main versus a thin main block. The thin main block won't handle the horsepower we'll be making with this build. Most 75 and later 400s were thin main blocks, just like you had in your TA over there. Okay, I think we'll keep what we got here. As for a crankshaft, what do you guys like to use? We're going to use this Eagle armor coated crankshaft. It's got a 4.250 stroke, so with our bore size, it's going to end up at 474 cubic inches. Now, when he says stroker, for you guys at home that don't know, this is what he's talking about. An engine's displacement is based around the volume of the cylinders, and it's rated by either cubic inches or liters. The more displacement you have, the more potential for power. This is why you hear people say there's no replacement for displacement. You can increase that amount by increasing the travel of the piston with a longer stroke of the crank, hence the name stroker. Now you can't just buy a crankshaft, throw it in something and make a big bunch of power. All these components have to be matched all together from top to bottom to make big power. That's going to live for longer than a day, am I right? That's correct. Not only match components, but this crankshaft is perfectly balanced to these rods and pistons. As for rods, we're using this Eagle H-beam design. Now this rod is considered a long rod for a Pontiac. It's 6.8 inches long. Now when you guys were unboxing these, I was checking them out. You guys are probably pretty proud of those, aren't you? Yes, we are. This is a Butler Performance Exclusive Forge Draws Piston. It features a flat top design and the latest strut design for strength and durability. In the end, Tom, we developed a line of pistons for a number of Pontiac applications that are strong, durable, and they make power. I guess first thing we need to do is drop this cranks. Oh wait, that thing's heavy and we gotta get the main caps off. So I guess we better do that. Still ahead, we begin construction on the engine for our giveaway Trans Am and get into the nitty gritty about making big power with natural aspiration. Okay, we are back and ready to put together the bottom end of our 474 Pontiac engine. And for a rear main seal on a street engine, the butlers recommend a graphite impregnated Teflon rear main seal. And well, I guess we're ready for the crankshaft. Yes, sir. By the way, this 4340 forging is a big upgrade from the Trans Am's stock cast crank. And the ESP armor coating, well, it's going to reduce friction and buy us another 30 horsepower. After lubing up the bearings with Royal Purple Max Tough, the main caps can go on. Rodney puts a dab of ARP Ultra Torque on the studs and nuts before cinching down the mains and torquing them from the center out. In place should be within four to eight thousandths and ours is right at four, so we're in good shape. Rodney's had plenty of experience assembling rods and pistons for street and all-out race engines. He uses plenty of lube and spiral locks to keep the pins in place. Oh, and to keep from butchering up those thumbs and fingers while installing those locks, a small flat screwdriver can be your best friend. Then he does some filing to set each of the end gaps, checking each one inside the bore with a feeler gauge. The gap has to be large enough to allow for expansion when hot, but small enough to control blow-by gases. Next, he's installing one piston rod assembly. followed by the camshaft, which is a custom grind hydraulic roller from Comp. It's designed to make plenty of power and torque for the street and provide ample vacuum for the power brakes. With some Loctite thread locker on the retaining bolts, the double roller timing set gets installed. As you probably know, degreeing the cam is the only way to verify the accuracy of your cam grind. And although it's rare, the crank key or timing chain could be off a bit. Butler's Timing Gear Retaining Washer replaces the fuel pump drive that you would be using if you were running a carburetor. 
Now you can install the rest of the pistons and rod assemblies into the block. Then add the rod caps and torque the rod bolts to spec. Now Rodney's just about got our bottom end fixed up and we're ready to move on to the oil pump. Now Butler Performance offers an exclusive pump that's perfect for our build. One common problem with the stockers is this little thin plate. Whenever you combine the high pressure and a quick revving engine, this thing will flex and cause you to lose pressure, and they've solved that problem. Not only is this pump flow tested and blueprinted, there are several other modifications to make this thing one great piece. All right, we got our oil pump installed. We just about got the oil pan done, and I've got another cool part I'd like to show you all. Butler Performance offers an exact reproduction of the timing cover. Now, whether you're doing a high performance application or restoration, oftentimes the timing covers have a whole lot of pitting here around this gasket where the water pump seals. Getting one of these can save you a boatload of time. Well, this is one of the Edelbrock Performer heads we're using in our Pontiac engine build. It's a true deep port design, which requires a deep flange header. Now that's not to be mistaken with this other head they make, which is a round port design that requires a round shaped header, despite the inverted D's here in the middle. The combustion chambers have a new fast burn design to make more power, and Butler Performance goes the extra mile porting the intake and exhaust ports, machining the deck surfaces, and adding new stiffer comp springs. These heads are resting on high-performance gaskets that Butler designed for this setup. Oh, and Edelbrock now offers its own ARP bolts specially made for their heads. After lubing up the bores, we can drop in a set of hydraulic roller lifters. So Dave, is there anything special about the push rod you guys offer? Yeah, we use a restricted push rod with these hydraulic rollers. A lot of people think that's only for race motors, mm -hmm. but for any engine, we want to keep plenty of oil in the bottom end and still give enough oil to the top to lube the valve train. Yeah, because one of the worst things you can do is pump the pan dry, isn't it? Absolutely. Tom, come here, I got a little trivia for you. What you got? Did you know the first rocker arm was invented by a guy named Jonathan Rundle Bacon back in the mid-1800s. I can't say that I did. Did you happen to know him? No, I didn't know him, but <laughs> I do know that uh, they called the tip a Rundle for a long time. Hmm. How about that? Well, I gotta say, these things right here are quite a sweet piece, and I bet he'd give his right arm or leg for a set of these dudes. Comp Ultra Gold, nothing but the best. These are stud-mounted full rollers with a 1.65 ratio. To help our Pontiac keep its cool, we're using a mechanical water pump with a billet impeller that we got from Summit Racing. And to help keep all them moving parts happy, six quarts of comp break-in oil, then we can prime to ensure we've got ample oil flow. It's very important to use an intake manifold that complements the more aggressive cam we installed and the free-flowing exhaust we'll be using. This Performer RPM from Edelbrock is a dual plane that's made for Pontiacs that operate in the 1500 to 6500 RPM range. Plus, the butlers have gone in and opened up the runners to match the head work they did. And with that nice aluminum finish, this thing's gonna make the engine look like a piece of Pontiac jewelry. Well, Dave and Rodney, I wanna say thank you guys for helping us out on the build. And I tell you, I'm pretty excited about getting to drive this thing. Now, as for dyno on this thing just to get the power, well, these guys have put better than 100 of these things together, so they ought to know. 474 will make 550 horsepower, but close to 600 for pounds of torque. Wow. Well, that ought to move that old TA around pretty easily. Oh, yeah. You pretty excited about that? That's very stout. Today on Detroit Muscle, 
we'll keep you in suspense as our giveaway Trans Am gets new legs and 600 pound feet of torque wedged in, around, and under it. It's major upgrades galore as this TA goes from tired to wired. Detroit Muscle starts now. Our first project means that we're going to be kicking it bandit style with this 1978 Pontiac Trans Am. We bought it from a lady who's had it since the mid 80s, then slapped it on the chassis dyno with some help from our sister show, Engine Power. All that we could squeeze out of it was a monstrous 152 horsepower. Well, that's not going to work. So then we got the Pontiac Power Gurus from Butler Performance to help us build up a Pontiac 455 into a 550 horsepower stroker that'll roast the tires plumb off this bird. The grand idea here is to pay tribute to the iconic black and gold special edition Trans Ams that we all remember, and then give ours away to one of you guys. Of course, a lot of the inspiration comes from that Burt Reynolds classic, Smokey and the Bandit. Hopefully, we won't have any county mounties chasing us when this thing's done. Well, right now, we're kind of an impasse. We got that big, bad stroker motor ready to drop into its new home. However, that 150 horse dog is still sitting in its place. The plan is to snatch this old motor out so we can spruce up a bit, clean paint all under here before we drop in that new engine. In case you're wondering, no, this isn't the original engine from this car. It came from an earlier model TA. So keeping the numbers matching engine, well, that's a no-go since it's already gone. So first things first, we got to get this hood off. There are a few things in life more titillating than trying to contort your body around a hood while doing major engine surgery. So I think we'll go ahead and lose ours for this swap. Little bird's heavy. Don't forget to drain the radiator into a pan before you pull the lower hose. That way you can save yourself a pretty big mess. What he just said about avoiding a mess? There we go. Well, so much for that. We know that the old exhaust is going away for good. So no need to struggle when the reciprocating saw makes short work of removing it. Okay, let's see if I can get this old dry shaft going. There. You know, we're using a lift to get all this stuff out from underneath, but if you're doing this at home, don't forget without the dry shaft, things are gonna want to roll. Be ready for the roll. The motor mount bolts can come out next, as well as the transmission crossmember bolts. We're removing the old trans in conjunction with the engine, so stuff like that and the speedo cable will need to be disconnected. Of course, you can't forget the training linkage. Let it down. If you're tackling an engine swap for the first time, safety should be your first concern. Use a cherry picker rated to handle the weight. This transmission decided to dump fluid all over the floor for us. So try as we might to catch it, we got another mess to clean up. Well, after some additional exhaust trimming for clearance, well, she's pretty well ready to come out. It used to be too much, so let me know. I'll give you a break, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> what you huffing and a puffing for? I'm gonna blow your house down. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Joe. Funny thing about an old greasy engine is that it leaves a greasy old mess that's gotta be taken care of. That's her. All right, we got scrapers. What's this thing for? Are you gonna siphon some gas out? <laughs> well, it does kind of work as a Tennessee credit card, too, <laughs> but I'm gonna use this little piece of hose as a device, well, to keep water out of the gearbox. Yeah, that's pretty smart. Well, I'm gonna scrape some of the gunk off this engine cradle before we give this thing a bath, or before you do. We're simply gonna push this hose onto the return and then take it and loop it back around to the factory power steering hose. That keeps any water, moisture, or solvent, or cleaner out of that gearbox, keeps from messing it up. It's a dirty job, but like they say, somebody's got to do it. Some of this gunk has likely been here for better than 30 years. Is it time for lunch? I think it's time for moving this thing outside. All right. 
Guess we can do that before we go to lunch. Yes. Well, we're ready to spray on some cleaner. We got some degreaser from Safety Clean. We're gonna hose this stuff on, let it set, go grab a bite to eat, come back and see what we got. If you've got access to a power washer, it'll save you a boatload of time over a brush and bucket. And you can rent them pretty cheaply too. Well, we got everything taped up, cleaned up, ready to start doing some spraying. We're gonna put on some Duplicolor spray enamel to give our engine bay a makeover. Now this is engine enamel, and even though we're not really spraying the engine, this stuff is designed to withstand the temperatures and chemical elements that live under the hood of your car. Stick around and get the skinny on the mystical, magical inner workings of torque converters. Then we'll show you a snappy way to address potential cross-member incompatibilities, as well as a complete front suspension overhaul. Well, it looks like you got this old Pontiac wrapped and ready for a little personality, huh? Oh yeah, we're gonna spray on a good bit of it. What are you gonna do first? Well, I'm gonna spray on some of this primer to give myself a good even canvas to start with. Mm -hmm. And then I might even let you start painting some. Uh, Pontiac Blue, I hope. Oh yeah, not none of that Ford stuff that you like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the primer that we're using is Duplicolor's Engine Enamel Primer. The reason that you want to try to have a uniform canvas for your paint is that the colors of the components themselves can affect the color of the paint that goes over top of it and spraying all of them the same shade of primer not only preps the surface, but it makes everything the same hue, ensuring that your top coat will have a consistent look. Duplicolor also offers that iconic Pontiac blue in their engine enamel lineup. And once the masking is removed, well, you can see it looks pretty darn good on our stroker. Well, here's what we're mating up to that beautiful blue engine. It's a 700R4 Street Fighter from TCI, tough enough to handle 750 horsepower. It's an automatic with overdrive for comfortable cruising on the interstate. Now, the TCI torque converter is built for more low and mid-range power, and it has a 2400 RPM stall to complement that cam in our 474. You know, torque converters are often a mysterious and confusing part in the drivetrain, and if that's the case for you, watch this, it might help. Torque converters are built with one thing in mind, transferring power from your engine to an automatic transmission. It does this by turning an impeller with a series of vanes attached to it. When the engine reaches the converter's stall speed, the fluid inside the unit is forced toward the outside of the housing by centrifugal force. The fluid will then begin to spin a turbine which is splined into the transmission's input shaft. The stall of the converter simply refers to the RPMs required to begin forcing movement of the turbine. Higher stall converters are typically employed in more performance-oriented applications, whereas stock-style setups will often employ lower stall units. Now, since the R4 is basically a Chevy transmission, we need this adapter plate to make it work with our 474. It's all part of a kit that includes a linkage bracket, TV cable, trans cooler, hardware, and even all the training fluid you'll need. Easy does it. Slow down, stop. <clears throat> okay, come up. Just a smidge. Up. With our adapter plate bolted onto the back of the engine and the flex plate in place, up a little bit. There it is. Perfect. The power plant and transmission can be joined in holy matrimony. Then we'll work on plugging the newlyweds into their appropriate home in our Trans Am. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Easy does it. We don't want to scratch up our nicely painted engine or car. It doesn't take long before we start to realize that, well, the factory cross member is hanging us up. We try as we might, it's not going to allow us to properly position the transmission. <laughs> that 
it's no big deal. A few bolts and some hammer taps, and the old cross member is out of the way. Then, the engine can seat onto its mounts. Tell you what, man, that's a pretty little motor sitting in there. Yeah, I think it looks just fine. It looks right at home. Keep your eyes peeled and we'll go through the disassembly and reassembly of our front suspension system, including a coilover upgrade that improves your handling, along with the brake swap we're doing on this old bird. Well, we just about got our transmission bolted up. We run into a little snag. Our stock cross member wouldn't bolt into place running this 700R4, but that's no biggie because we got this X-Factor cross member from American Powertrain. The X-Factor is an all aluminum, highly modular piece that allows you to run a huge combination of drivetrain components while being both strong and lightweight. Now the factory rubber mount was never really designed to withstand the power that we're gonna have in our Trans Am. So we got this pretty little jewel here that we got from Prothane. And I tell you, it's gonna handle all the abuse that we could ever throw at it. Well, naturally we want that thing to uh, drive as good as it runs. So here's an upgrade for the front suspension, all from Classic Performance Products, beginning with a stiffer inch and a quarter sway bar, some of their tubular upper and lower control arms, and a set of single adjustable coilover shocks. These things, by the way, will lower the ride height about an inch to two inches. So let the suspension tear down begin. The stock calipers are first to go, and we're gonna replace the rubber brake lines anyway, so those can just be clipped. Then the tie rods can be uh, persuaded out of the way. The sway bar links are going bye-bye as well, so instead of struggling to loosen them up, it's the old hot wrench. Then the sway bar drops out. The top shock mount is unbolted first, then the two bottom bolts can be loosened, allowing you to remove the shock. The spindle is held on with a couple of pin castle nuts. Come on, come on. Now be careful, this thing contains the energy of that front spring. Using a jack to hold the bottom control arm up while you remove the nut is a good way to keep that spring in check. Then you can let the jack down and remove the spring. But like I said, use caution. With that out of the way, the spindle can come off. A couple of bolts hold the upper control arm on, as well as a couple more, which hold on the lower one. You've seen us install tubular control arms many times before, and well, if you wondered why, it's simple. It offsets the stock suspension geometry and provides for better performance handling and helps you carve those corners a lot easier. Somehow, Joe managed to get the less greasy job of installing the shiny new parts. When it comes to how hard you want to run these bolts down, you want to make sure they're pretty darn tight. Now ready for coilovers, and here's a little tip for you. If you put a little Loctite anti-seize on this adjuster, it won't gall up when you're ready to use it. See if the thing will go up. To get these coilover shocks on, we'll have to cheat a bit using a nut and washer to hold the top in place. Here, let me help you, Joe. Then we'll get the two bottom bolts secured to the lower control arm. Here we go. And using a screw jack, we can load up the suspension, allowing us to remove the temporary nut and washer on top, then insert the proper rubber grommet and washer. Now, how much do you tighten down the shock nut? Well, you wanna squish down this rubber grommet until it's flush with this washer and no more. That's about enough. Now for the jam nut. Well, thanks to Tommy, and the bead blaster, and some paint, the spindle looks brand new. We also use our old screw jack trick to bring the spindle up where it can be bolted to the upper control arm. But if your car is on the ground, a floor jack does the job just as well. When you upgrade your suspension like this, it only makes sense to remove the old original steering components and install some new ones like these we got from rockauto.com. Otherwise, it's 
Kind of like trying to play basketball in worn out cowboy boots. And once the car hits the road, you gotta come back and tighten everything up again because it will settle in during the first run. Why is it important to take one crucial step before you use a set of brand new brakes? We'll show you in just a few. Detroit Muscle will be right back. Hey, we're back after upgrading the front suspension on this old red bird. And well, since we also added some extra horsepower, we need some better binders to bring it to a halt. We'll start with a set of EBC Sport rotors. Now, these things have slots to keep the pads cooler and help them wear evenly. These dimples, well, they're all about degassing the rotors. Some Safety Clean Brake Cleaner will help us clean our new rotors, ensuring that there aren't any unwanted substances that could compromise our brake. We're also using EBC's Yellow Stuff pads, which are ideal for serious street and track use. They're made with a high friction formula. And the red break-in services, well, they make sure we get safe instant braking as soon as we install them. These EBC pads work with our factory calipers, which we've cleaned up and painted with cast iron colored paint. Now some of these cars did come with four wheel discs, but ours came with drums in the rear. However, we got a little trick for that and oh, you have to wait and see. Hey Joe, you got that old line off? Yeah, check it out. More cracks than you'd find at a plumber's convention. <laughs> well, you guys, you want to replace the rubber brake lines on these things because they're considered a consumable part. You got to think of them as like a set of tires. They just wear out, crack, and you don't want to replace one of them because if one's bad, they're all bad. And that's why Tommy is going to replace all of them with these we got from rockauto.com. Sounds like I got the short end of the stick of that one. I don't know. Good day today, and uh, I guess next time we'll jump on the rear of this car, brakes and such, and oh, show you that little trick we talked about. Yeah, that's it. Get yeah. out of the way. All Get right. out of the way. Jeez. Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll get the fuel delivery decided on our giveaway tribute Trans Am. Learn how to install an EFI system on an old school stroker for big power and reliability. Then we'll give the old Pontiac a leg workout as we rebuild the rear and do a low buck disc brake conversion. Hold on to your cowboy hat and latch on to your CB mic. Our special edition Trans Am Tribute giveaway car rebuild is in full swing. We're taking this 78 TA and reworking it from top to bottom, including a 550 horsepower stroker engine. We also plugged in an overdrive transmission to give her some longer legs and did a complete rebuild on the front suspension and steering components with performance upgrades that are gonna make this thing stick like glue. But we ain't done yet. When she leaves here to go to one of you lucky winners, it's gonna be a tire eating tribute to the iconic special edition Trans Am that we all remember. Today we're gonna go out back and we're gonna snatch out that factory rear axle and show you guys the basics of a rebuild. And we're gonna upgrade those drum brakes. But before we do all that, we're gonna get started on feeding this 474. Now, carburetors are plenty cool for a bunch of different muscle car applications. But for drivability, performance, and fuel economy, it's hard to beat EFI. We're going to feed the Pontiac with this new fast, easy EFI 2.0 setup that, well, just like the original, is self-tuning, but they added some new features to help it flow more air for better performance, plus it'll support up to 1,200 horsepower. It's a complete system, including a new mini ECU, handheld touchscreen device, O2 sensor, wiring harness all clearly labeled, and of course the heart of the system, the throttle body. The throttle body bolts directly onto a square bore intake flange, and we've got something else to install here too. Now Fast offers this optional throttle bracket that we're gonna be using. It's very sturdy, and the real beauty is it allows us to use the stock throttle cable and allows for a lot of adjustability. That means there's no need to spend more money on a custom cable. Using one of their square cable brackets, loosely mounted, we can insert the cable and cinch it down. Then, as with any carburetor or throttle body installation, we need to install a throttle return spring. Now, there's no denying that this is one stealthy looking unit. At 
first glance, you can't really find the vacuum ports, but don't worry about it. They still got the ports, whether you're running a thermal vacuum switch or those full throttle hood flaps. You know, most guys I know would rather get a couple of root canals than deal with wiring, and I can't say I blame them too much, but the folks at FAST took that in consideration when they designed this harness with the fewest connections in the market. Whenever wiring up this harness, there are a couple things that you need to keep in mind. They have two heavy gauge wires that are labeled battery positive and battery negative. You want to make sure to run both of these directly to the battery, not splice into the original harness of the car. Because whenever you do that, you're running the chance of getting into some interference or electrical noise. And fighting that issue, man, it can be tough. Speaking of electrical interference, you need to pay attention to your plugs, wires, and other ignition components. Now, if you're running solid core wires and non-resistor plugs, well, sorry, you're gonna have to change them out to avoid that noise. With the conversion that we're doing, we have to run an O2 sensor so that we can monitor the air fuel mixture. The headers that we decided to go with are from Doug's, they're ceramic coated, and it's a full length set of headers. Now, the problem that we run into, we didn't order them with the bungs already installed. But there's no real big issue behind that, but there is a little more science to it than just drilling a hole. First thing you want to consider is the amount of distance between the sensor and the head. You want to allow at least 20 inches of tube because if you don't, well, the exhaust temperatures will be so high that it'll damage the sensor. The next thing, if you're running catalytic converters in this system, you want to make sure the sensor is upstream. Otherwise, if it's behind the cats, well, it's going to be getting a false reading. One last thing, you want to make sure that the sensor is located at least 10 degrees above the horizon. If it's too low, kind of like this, well, the sensor can get moisture in it and damage it. When it comes to the job of getting fuel from the tank to the throttle body we just installed, well, FAST has a couple of options, a return style system and a non-return style. Their non-return or returnless system uses a pump to push fuel from the tank to the engine and uses the ECU to regulate pressure by varying the speed of the pump. While the return style also pushes fuel from the tank to the engine, the excess flows through a return line back to the tank. The fuel pressure regulator controls the amount of flow and the PSI of the fuel in the system. We chose a return style system because of the benefits of more accurate pressure and because the flow keeps the fuel cooler. Whenever you install an inline pump like this, make sure you keep it as close to the fuel tank as possible and lower than the tank to avoid any kind of priming issues. Now, FAST offers several different kits for different applications, supporting up to 1,400 horsepower, so I guess we got some room to grow. Still ahead, we do the tail end tango with, with the old TA, showing you how to rebuild a GM C-Clip rear end step by step. Like we had mentioned earlier, well, we're gonna be rebuilding that rear end and upgrading the brakes. We have some plans for the rear suspension also, but that's gonna be a little later down the road. But for now, we gotta get all that stuff out from under it. We'll start by removing the bottom nut from the shock. Then the U-bolts holding the leaf springs to the rear end can come off. The sway bar is getting replaced, so it can go away completely. With this lower plate removed, we can use the rear end stand and the weight of the car to remove the rear end. Stop, stop. All right. Dropping the springs down and raising the car back up will make it a lot easier to get the rear end out. GM made a train load of these 10 volt rear ends with 8.5 C-clip axles, not only for TAs, but Camaros and well, a lot of other models as well. Now, the gear ratios could have ranged from, well, the mid twos to the mid threes. Now, like the engine, ours could have been swapped out over the years, so we're not really sure what we got here, just that it'll be improved when we're done. Pulling the diff cover off first will expose the differential and allow us to drain out all that stinky old gear oil. Mm, yummy. Then some persuasion from a hammer and pry bar will help us get the old drums off. This small bolt holds the pin in that keeps your axles in in one of these GM C-Clip rear ends. 
with the pin out, pushing the axles in just a bit, makes the clips fall off, then the axles come right out. Before the main caps come off, it's a good idea to stamp which one goes on which side, so there's no confusion later on because it does matter. With those gone, we can pull out the Big Daddy, the carrier. There's a large nut that holds the yoke in place on the front of the unit. A few more hammer taps and the pinion comes out. This pinion bearing is going to be replaced along with the seal that's holding it in. And we're also going to replace these two races as well. The seal and bearing at the end of the axle tubes are going bye-bye. And we'll disconnect the old brake line to allow us to remove the old brakes and the backing plate. Well, we're just about ready to throw in all these parts that we got from Mosier Engineering. Well, we still got to clean up the housing, but that'll be a little later down the road. But let's talk about why all these parts are an upgrade. Now this is our old stock worn out pies unit and it uses what's referred to as an S-spring. And this thing commonly cracks, breaks, and causes some pretty severe damage. Whereas our new unit, it's got a total different design and is a far better piece. Our stock yoke is nowhere near strong enough to handle the power we have, so we had to upgrade to this billet steel piece. This thing is strong enough to withstand 750 horsepower. Now our stock axle, it's a 28 spline. We decided to go with a 30 spline. Now the larger diameter spline count, well, it is a stronger axle, but the material this thing's made out of, well, it increases it too. We're at about 50% stronger over the stock one. With the new races, bearing, and seal in place, our pinion is the next piece to get installed. The new yoke can get installed now. And we don't do much plumbing around here, but a pipe wrench is a big help in getting this thing tightened down. The pause unit requires a set of shims on each side of its bearings to position it correctly. There's a certain amount of adjustment that happens here. Well, it can take several tries to get the shims just right. We're at 8,000s on backlash, so we're good to go. These rear end components come with paint that you use to test your pinion and carrier placement. If you spin the pinion and the teeth come around looking like this. Yep, yeah, that's what you don't want. That's too shallow. We're gonna have to go a little deeper. You have to make adjustments so that there's more meshing between them. If they look like this, you're in good shape. After Tom got finished rebuilding our 8.5 rear end, we went ahead and did a rear drum to disc brake conversion. Now, this is a real budget friendly project you might want to take on yourself, and it all starts with a junkyard backing plate from a 98 to 02 Camaro. And from there, you can use more used parts or some you find off the shelf at the parts store. Best part is it's a both on project with little or no fabrication, and here's how you do it. Now you will have to make some sort of eighth inch space there like we made out of aluminum and it goes right in front of that Camaro backing plate we got from the junkyard. Now we can go ahead and grab the axle and being careful not to damage the seal, slide it into place. Then a magnet makes it easy to insert the C-clip and pulling the axle back out holds it in place. Some Loctite thread locker on the pin locking bolt will ensure that these components stay where they're supposed to be. I put plenty on. Well, finally we get to bolt on this Mosier differential cover. Now here's a very important point. Make sure you back off these load bolts before you put this thing on. Otherwise, you could cause serious damage to your cover. Torque specs on these bolts are 25 foot-pounds. Torque spec on these guys, though, is just 5 foot-pounds. The black jam nuts, 10 foot pounds. Now for the home stretch. The rotors go on easy as pie, and these are the ones that would fit those 98 to 02 Camaros. Same goes for the calipers and the brake pads. These pads are the EBC yellow stuff units, which are the same that we opted for on the front brake. That's how you do it drums to disc. 
Well, the only thing we need to do now is put in the lubricant. But whatever you use, make sure that it's got the limited slip additive in it. Oh, yeah, nothing like those additives. The older you get, the more you need them. What? You can keep that. Today on Detroit Muscle, we put a spring in the step of our giveaway tribute Trans Am by plugging in some upgraded rear suspension. Learn that there's more to measuring for a drive shaft than you might think. We bought the 78 Firebird from a Trans Am fan who was ready to let her red bird fly the coop. Soon we were making plans to turn it into an iconic black and gold bandit that we could give away. That is, after swapping its well-worn 400-inch V8 for a screaming 474 stroker engine with help from the Pontiac gurus at Butler Performance. We made it to a new 4-speed 700R Ford Trans, dropped it in, and later topped it off with a throttle body EFI. We also gave the TA a new, beefier front suspension and brake setup. Then, we went out back to snatch out the rear end, which we rebuilt with a new gear set and a pause unit, before sliding in 30 spline axles. Finally, with a mix of old and new parts, we converted the rear drum brakes to disc. Today on Detroit Muscle, our main mission is to beef up the bottom end of that Trans Am. We're gonna give it a new rear suspension like we did up front. We'll also install some exhaust and headers and measure for drive shaft among other things. Oh, we'll also reinstall our rear end that we upgraded with those Mosier components. And in case you might notice something missing, we did remove the rotors, make this thing a little lighter, and easier to lift up. Tommy and I are a little bit crazy sometimes, but not stupid. First up is these leaf springs from Classic Performance Products. The beauty behind them, well, they're going to give us that inch and a half drop like what we used on the front. This kit allows you to upgrade several components over stock, kind of like this puny little sway bar. It's a 5 8 of an inch. We're going with a one incher that'll make that car handle like a dream. As for the bushings that come in the kit, well, they're upgraded to the urethane, and they come with this little packet of goo. You want to make sure to install just a dab of this on the inside. Not only does it lubricate the little sleeve that goes in there, but if you don't do this, well, you can develop a squeak. Your thing bushings are a little more performance oriented than your classic rubber style. They tend to be a little more stiff than the rubber ones, but they're actually easier to install. Some of that lube is also good to use on the inside of the bushing as well. With the shackles in place under the car, the backside of the springs can be bolted into place. A nylon locking nut comes with the kit, but even so, you'll still want to come back after the first few miles and retighten your suspension. We'll reuse the stock hanger, it just needed to be cleaned up a bit. With a lift, you can lower the car onto the rear end. If you're doing this on jack stands, a jack under the differential is a tried and true method. All right, we're good. Three bolts hold the hanger in place, and you want these to be pretty darn tight. There's a rubber isolator that goes between the rear and the spring. Don't forget it. If you do, expect a really rough ride. With the new kit, they did increase the diameter of the U-bolts. That way it increases the clamping force, and by doing that, it also increases the strength of the suspension. We won't tighten these up yet because the sway bar is next. Well, at this point, we can go ahead and install our rear sway bar. You know, the extra stiffness of this thing, those urethane bushings are gonna make a big difference. Oh, don't forget to put some of this lube on from the kit. Make stabbing it in place a lot easier. The upper hangers come out while we're at it in exchange for the new ones from the kit. 
These are a little bit wider and also stronger to accommodate our upgraded pieces. Once the connecting rod is in, it's simply a matter of bolting the sway bar up to it and tightening them down. Rear shocks are pretty simple to install. The top bolts can be zipped in first, then the bottom nut can go on along with its grommet and washer. Now I'm not quite ready to tighten up my lower shock mount yet because I want to make sure all my other stuff is tightened up. You can see this is still loose. Now whenever you're tightening up U-bolts, you want to make sure that the same amount of threads is sticking through the nut. If you've got way too much on one side versus the other, you're going to have to back it up, try to tighten the other side. Still ahead, we'll show you the right way to measure for a new drive shaft, get a look at the exhaust system for our TA, and we'll reinforce its backbone with some subframe connectors. Well, now that we've got the rear end in place, there you are. You got something to measure with? <laughs> uh, I can fetch something. Okay. Well, we're going to measure for what goes between the rear end and our transmission. You know, your drive shaft builds every bit of power your engine makes. For example, in low gear, the torque from the engine is multiplied many times, so it's critical to get one that can do the job and to make critical measurements. Now we're getting ours from Dan's driveline and they provide this form that we downloaded and we need to fill it out. You ready for this? You gonna make me help? Yep. Whenever you're measuring for a drive shaft, you wanna make sure that the rear axle's at ride height. And if you're running leaf springs, well, it's not gonna change it a whole lot, but if you're running coils in a four link, yeah, it can definitely change it a bunch. We're gonna start by measuring from the differential yoke toward the transmission tail housing. And you always wanna make sure that you clock this thing in this direction, not running up and down, because it'll give you a different reading. Now, a common point to put the tape is right here on this edge. You just wanna make sure that this imaginary line is the center of your U-joint cup. Forty-eight and three-quarter. Okay, 48, three quarters. And an eighth. Just kidding. Now we need to measure to see how much of the output shaft is sticking out past the tail housing of the transmission. And we're looking at about nine sixteenths of an inch. Those two measurements will allow the builder to determine the proper length and the correct amount of clearance and slip for the shaft. Generally, you want between three-fourths of an inch and an inch of slip, and if you don't have that, well, you won't be able to install the drive shaft or you'll break the transmission. Whenever ordering a drive shaft, you will have to determine what yoke you're running. There are a couple different types, and these are the two most popular. There's one that's got the little bitty tabs that help retain and locate the U-joint, where there's the other style that doesn't have anything, and it uses a little C-clip on the cut. With that determined, now you have to measure for the width of the U-joint. And if you're running a tab style, you have to measure in between these two little bitty tabs. If you're running the non-tab style, you have to measure in between this and this right here. Also, you want to make sure to measure from this point to this point, and that'll give you the diameter of the cup. And if you're running an old greasy piece like this one, be sure to clean it real good. That way, you've got an accurate measurement. All right, that's it for the arithmetic, but uh, not for the form, of course. They also want to know things like the type of transmission you're going to use, horsepower levels, intended use of the vehicle, the weight, and so forth. Yeah, all this plays an important role on how hefty that drive shaft needs to be built to make sure that it's a safe piece to get that power from the front to the rear of the car. Well, I guess I better get online and get this stuff in. Uh, you can do the exhaust, can't you? My computer's a little slow today. You know, an Etch-a-Sketch isn't a computer, right? Our Butler Performance 474 is going to breathe through this Magnaflow Catback Direct Fit Exhaust System. The tubing is mandrel bent, two and a half inch stainless steel, flowing through a pair of those straight through wide open mufflers. This will give that TA a smooth, deep tone. This kit also includes everything you're going to need to hang it up under your ride, including the clamps and the OEM style exhaust hangers. And my favorite part, the kit also includes a pair of these iconic Trans Am tips, polished out to a nice finish. This kit is a breeze to install, so we're going to skip the step of showing you how to put it in. And when we get back from the break, we're going to show you what we've got up our sleeve to connect this cool system to that engine so it can sing that sweet song. 
Hey, we're back and our cat back exhaust system's right at home under the TA. We also welded in a pair of catalytic converters from Magnaflow to make our 78 legal for the street. With that handled, we got something else to consider. Now that we have a stroker engine and high performance powertrain in this TA, the chassis is going to be subjected to more abuse than it was ever designed to handle. Now that means we got some structural issues to deal with. Over time, a car can actually lose structural integrity. So to straighten and stiffen it up, you need to level out the subframe. Then prepare to reinforce the two frame elements. One popular way to do that is to use subframe connectors to join them together as one unit. Now we could have bought a set of pre-built subframe connectors, but we wanted to show you guys how to build them because they don't make subframe connectors for every make and model of vehicle out there. So with some eighth inch tubing and a little bit of plate, we'll have a set in a jiffy. With subframe connectors, you're trying to connect the meat of the rear of the car to the meat of the front right here at the end of the subframe. To get started, we've got to do a little bit of measuring. From the rear of the subframe to the point where we'll join it to the unibody frame is about 39 inches. The brake line needs to be pulled back out of the way for now, no big deal. Then we'll clean up the surface area that we're going to weld with a grinder. Well, that piece looks pretty good, but I'm going to go ahead and take out this piece of tubing because I want to cut this out of bevel so that it will match this angle. Next thing I want to do is make a mark right here. That way I can take it off and cut it because I want to move this up so that this piece of tubing lines up better with the end of the subframe. An eighth inch plate to widen the connector, then another one to allow us to tie into the subframe can be tacked into place, then burned in. A couple of holes on each side will allow us to bolt it together, then we'll take it down to finish welding it. Well, I got it finished welded up, welded in place to the rear rail, and bolted to the front subframe. Looks pretty good. All I have to do now is make another one for the other side. Today on Detroit Muscle, it's time to get the Trans Am ready for a coat of that glossy black paint. Learn how you can take cracked plastic panels and fix them up real nice. Our Trans Ams came a long way since we bought it and brought it home to the shop. First on agenda was to build a potent stroke Pontiac power plant. Filled with top shelf performance parts, after we painted it poncho blue, we backed it with a new 700R tranny and dropped it between the TA's fenders. Then to feed it, we topped it off with some fuel injection. To make it ride as well as it roars, we upgraded the entire front suspension then gave it better brakes to haul down all that horsepower. Out back, we dropped the stock 10-volt rear end for a massive makeover, including new gears, a posi unit, and a pair of new axles. Then after a drum-to-disc brake conversion, we stabbed the rear back in place, followed by more suspension upgrades, including a set of lower springs. We finished up underneath with a new, better-flowing exhaust before custom making a pair of subframe connectors to stiffen up the chassis. Well, now it's time to start the TA's transformation from red to iconic banded black and gold. You know, the body on this old bird's not too bad. In fact, it's pretty darn solid. However, that doesn't mean we can just hose on some black paint and slap on decals. Yeah, that's no joke. This thing is gonna need some love and attention in the sandpaper department. But before we get all that started, there's a few little items we wanna take care of to make sure this thing's one nice ride. Whenever you're taking a look at purchasing one of these second gen F bodies, you wanna look at the side panels on them because these things, well, if they're broken up and tore up and you have to replace them, well, they can be a little bit pricey. Whenever I was taking a look at ours, they do have a few little cracks in them, but nothing that's unrepairable. Now you can't just go to snatching on this thing by taking off those three screws and expect it to fall out. You've got two studs that have to be removed from the inside of the quarter panel. It's not that big a deal, but you just gotta make sure you do it. And you can see right here, this whole car was a factory black ride. Okay, the next thing we need to do is take our little small grinder here and kind of dig out a bevel into this crack. What that does, that increases our surface area where we're planning to bond, giving us a stronger repair. Yeah, somebody's already tried to repair it once. 
If you notice, I'm trying to use it at a low speed because if you use it at a high speed, it'll just melt the plastic and kind of ball up on one side. That's pretty good. We're just about midway of our repair here. The next thing you want to do is take an air gun and kind of blow off all the dust and debris and then follow it up with some acetone. This stuff doesn't leave a residue like a lot of the other cleaners because you want to make sure that your panel you're working on, well, it's free from oil or grease or something like that as well. Now, whenever you're getting ready to wipe some of this stuff down, there's a little technique that you need to keep in mind. Let's say you was pouring this stuff on there and you went to wiping on it. Well, a lot of people would take it and dump that on there like that. That's a no-no. See, this is why. We've got a clean rag, we've got a lot of this dust here, and this is what happens whenever you do the cleaning on there. Well, whenever you take the bottle, lay it on the top, dump it over a time or two, you're just putting all those contaminants back inside that bottle, and that can bite you in the tail later down the road. So what you wanna do is take your rag and pour the stuff on top of it. That way, it keeps it out of there. All right, my man, you ready for some sticky stuff? Is that a trick question? I hope not. You know, there are all kinds of adhesives out there on the market for jobs like ours. And some, like this two-part adhesive we got from single source, are used by collision and body shops. And, well, this is the kind of stuff that'll work on metal, fiberglass, and plastic. Shall we? Hey, before we mix equal parts of this stuff, here's a little tip for you. Use a piece of metal for your mixing surface. Otherwise, if you use cardboard, well, it's gonna soak up the liquid and give you an uneven mix. Something to remember while you're laying down your epoxy. The closer you can get it to being nice and level to the surface of the part, the less sanding you'll have to do once it's cured. So don't go bonkers with it. Now you may see this and think the stuff is turning loose. It's no big deal because it's still way too high. Once I sand it all down, this edge will be completely gone with a good strong bond. Once we're satisfied with the repair, we can make it pretty with a little plastic filler. Remember the epoxy is for structure, the body filler, well that's for appearance. Still ahead, we'll show you how to unload the gooey bits when your ride's been stickerfied. And then it's a one-of-a-kind modification for our Trans Am that brings the honeycomb scheme one step further. Hey, we're back with some more body work on our Pontiac, and goes without saying, this bird flew from the factory with a lot of decals on it, all of which have to be removed before any serious paint work. Now, if you poke around on the internet, you'll find a lot of methods for doing this, everything from hair dryers to chemicals, but we like this simple stripe-off wheel, which kind of acts like a big giant pencil eraser. It's easy and it's fast. Now, this thing does work like a charm to roll these decals off the car, but one word to the wise, don't hammer on the trigger and apply a bunch of pressure in one spot. You can, by way of friction, build up enough heat at the surface to damage your finish. See, I told you it worked pretty good. Oh, Joe just showed you a cool trick to use on that little rubber eraser wheel. But I've got another little thing you might be interested to see, a plastic razor blade. Now, whenever you go to scraping off some decals, you can do it with a metal one, but it takes a whole lot more skill and a lot more effort to pay attention to make sure you don't mess up the paint surface. But these, can be pretty handy. Adding a bit of heat to removing a decal can help a bunch. And whenever you're using it on an old one, it helps that much more. The heat gun softens the vinyl in the decals. It makes it a lot more pliable, which in turn makes it a lot easier to peel off. Anyone who has ever tried to peel these off without any heat can tell you, it's a lot easier this way. Well, looks like the old Trans Am stickers still sticking around, kinda. We've gotta work on getting rid of the goo. Now, we're gonna just use some acetone 
And since we're just painting this car, but if you had a car that you were removing the decals and you cared about the paint, you wanna make sure whatever you're using doesn't damage your finish. Also, like we are, since we're painting this thing, you wanna make sure not to use anything oil-based to get this stuff off, because that can be quite a catastrophe whenever you're trying to paint over top of oil. Ugh, that'd be a mess. Now it could be that you apply a little acetone and this stuff just slides right off the finish. If that's the case, hey, good for you. Expect to make a few passes with both your chemical and razor blade though. And sometimes this old nasty glue is pretty darn stubborn. And it seems like the acetone is just smearing it around. Keep at it because it's getting gunky like that due to the acetone breaking down the glue. Now we're getting our decals out of the way so we can paint this TA, but if you were just trying to get rid of all the decals because you didn't like them, here's a case where peeling them wouldn't work. You can't see it, but you can definitely feel it. Somewhere along the way, this one got clear coated. Only way it's coming off is sand it or grind it. So if you're gonna do that, you're gonna have to paint it anyway. Well, all right, guys, we made some pretty good headway getting ready for the paint and body work on our Trans Am. Next thing we're gonna do is add a little bit of detail to this side scoop. First order of business is getting it out of the fender. Once the inner fender is out of the way, you can remove four nuts and the scoop slides right off. So what the plan is, is to replace this little grill in here with one that we picked up from our local steel supplier. This cool little piece here is honeycombed and it's gonna match the grill in the front of the Trans Am. So we've gotta get this old one out of it. Now originally, this little steel mesh is either glued in with some kind of epoxy or an adhesive and we've gotta get it out. You could use, a, let's say, a heat gun and heat this stuff up and pry it out or you could do like we're gonna do and use a little pry tool like a pocket knife and kind of pop it out. The beauty of this step is, since the thing's going away, you can get ornery with it if you have to. Just remember, you're also trying to save the piece of fiberglass it's attached to. Okay, now we have to get the old glue off, and if we can't pop it off, we'll just have to use the grinder. Well, I got just about all the glue off, but now I've got to come back with a little small grinder to prep the surface around here. Now, this thing is originally made from fiberglass, so you want to be real careful with it, not get too aggressive, because you could mess it up. With the surface prep, the honeycomb metal that we're going to use can be marked where we want to snip it leave plenty of room to attach it to the scoop. A pair of tin snips is all we need to cut out the piece that we'll be using. No need for overkill. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is take a little dead blow hammer here and kind of smash these back flat. because you can see, they're tweaked just a bit from snipping them. Then I'll toss it into the blaster. And we'll be ready to glue it on. Well, I've got my piece all prepped. Now we're ready to bond it to the scoop. And to do that, I'm gonna use some of this two-part epoxy that we showed you how to use earlier in the show. A little bit of this stuff goes a long way. It's not a structural component after all. There you go. That's one of those little bitty details that can add quite a bit to your ride. And Let's say with a little bit of paintwork and some taping, it can look like this. That's one sweet little scoop. The Bandit's back to steal the show on today's Detroit Muscle. Morphing from retail red to true Bandit black, a guest pro painter helps the team on the TA's transformation, which includes a new trick carbon fiber hood and enormous iconic bird. A 
Our giveaway Trans Am is nearing the home stretch before it leaves the Detroit Muscle Shop for good and finds its way into one of your homes. Now you've seen us throw a ton of performance upgrades at this bad boy. 550 horsepower and improved handling components are going to take the bird to a whole new level. But here's the rub. This thing is red, and resale red isn't the color you think of when you imagine a Trans Am from this generation, now is it? Nope. You think of that iconic black and gold that Burt Reynolds drove while he was on the lam from that Buford T. Justice. Well, we've been saying all along that red's gonna go away and today is the day. Yep, it's time for the TA's big visual transformation and thanks to Tommy and his guest, that work is already well underway. We have the good fortune of knowing some of the best car builders in the business and we made good use of that when we called in some help for our Trans Am bodywork and paint. Chris Ryan is the owner of Ryan's Rod and Custom out of 96 South Carolina and he builds some of the coolest and classiest rides that are out there today. One good example is this 53 Cadillac convertible named Root Beer Float. But customs aren't his only thing and that's good for us. We're putting him on the end of a piece of sandpaper and after that, we'll put a paint gun in his hand so he can lay down some starlight black. Well, all right, guys, we've got the car in the booth. We've got it primed up and sanded down, and we're just about ready to hose on some sealer and some base coat. But before we do all that, well, we've got to get it taped up. Now, at first glance, you guys may be saying, oh, no, it's still got some red paint on it. Well, this thing, we're not really doing what's called a restoration. This car is going to get a paint job, and there's a total difference between the two. Now, the paint job we're going to give it is going to be really nice. Y'all check this out. So excited. Awesome. You're not excited? I'm excited. I'm very excited. I don't believe you. The masking that we're doing is going to protect the windows, the interior, and the undercarriage from paint overspray. And we got to protect our pretty engine too. We'll be sure to mask it to the floor so nothing gets under the car. Okay, right now what we're going to do is we're going to mix up some PPG DP epoxy primer and use it as a sealer. Through the sanding process, we had some burn throughs and cut throughs and some bare metal sticking through. This will give us a more uniform canvas to lay down our base coat. This sealer comes in a variety of colors and you can actually slightly alter the look of your paint by choosing one shade or another. We're going for a straight up black look, so black sealer is what we'll go with. It's a good idea to run between 20 to 25 PSI on an HVLP gun for this material and to use a 50% overlap pattern when you spray. We sprayed our PPG sealer and allowed it to flash for 30 minutes. At this time, I'm mixing up some Starlight Black base coat to put on next. All the material that we're using on the Trans Am came from our old buddy, Brian, at Single Source, including this black base coat. When Tommy approached me about the color, he said he wanted the DBC 9700, which is our base coat black, which is standard black used by General Motors and Ford and stuff, and, and it was the black that was actually factory on the car when it was produced. The misconception about the name Starlight Black for this car would lead you to believe it's a metallic color, and it's not, not, it's not the case at all. It's actually a, a straight black, and that's the one problem that people run into. The variations on the, on the name um, would lead you to believe that it either has pearl or metallic in it, and it doesn't. It's a solid black color, which is when the car's done right, the way the, the guys do it here, it's slick, and you can't ask for a more beautiful paint job than a black car when it's done like this. Chris, our painter, is quite familiar with PPG, Besides him using their products for many years, PPG was a sponsor of his recreation of the famous K.S. Pittman Willys drag car, where he accurately reproduced its 60s era gold flake and candy paint. Man, those guys are really getting her done, and the paint job will be a done deal before you know it. Meanwhile, I've been trying to get us ready for the next step where the devil's in the decals. Lots of decals from year one. In fact, these are just some of the stripes you need to achieve that bandit look. Then, of course, there's old Big Bird here, the signature centerpiece of a TA hood. And, well, I know this original is still red. Wait till we reveal what we got to replace it. You see, well, you're going to have to wait. 
Next, the right way to lay down clear coat to finish up the Blackbird's exterior paint job. Plus, a trick way to lighten up the front end as we prep and paint a new carbon fiber hood, custom made for our Trans Am. Welcome back, y'all. We've primed, sanded, and sealed our Trans Am, along with hosing on some black base coat. Now we've got ourselves a black Trans Am. Woo! Now that we got our Starlight base coat laid down, we're gonna lay down four coats of PPG 2021 clear. All the guns we're using to spray the Opaniag are Awada HVLP models. HVLP means high volume, low pressure, and the big advantage to this type of gun over conventional high pressure ones is they actually cut down significantly on overspray and can save you a ton in material cost. With the clear laid down and the car rolled out of the booth, we can move on. Well, as mentioned earlier, the TA's factory steel hood is going south. Now check out its trick replacement. With our old hood, we did a little bit of inspecting on it, and it may look good from the top, but on the bottom side, well, it had some damage. So we decided instead of just repairing it, we'd replace it and do an upgrade all at the same time. Yeah, this is quite an upgrade. You made a good call on this. <laughs> the folks at uh, Carbon Customs made this for us. Now, all carbon fibers not alike, this hood's made of a high quality epoxy carbon formula that's got the ultra strength you want, as well as the lightweight you know with carbon fiber. Yeah, I appreciate this thing being considerably lighter than that stock one because sometimes this guy's a little scarce when it comes to getting some help. Okay, uh, changing the <laughs> subject, what's the game plan here? Well, I pretty much already got this thing scuffed down mm -hmm. with some 600 grit paper because we're going to paint it. Now, oftentimes you see people that leave it exposed. The problem behind that, well, over time, the resins inside of there turn kind of a milky color and then kind of lean toward the yellow side. If you go ahead and paint it, you don't have that problem. Tom, did you know one of the first people to use carbon fiber was Thomas Edison in his light bulbs for the filaments back in the 1800s? No, sure didn't. Mm -hmm. And just so you guys know, that little history lesson right there was brought to you by Joe Elmore, Detroit Muscle. Thank you, Tom. Since we're gonna paint the hood to keep the classic look on our Trans Am, a good scuff job with some 600 grit and a block is a good start. Then after the air blower gets rid of the excess dust, a couple of wipe down passes with some wax and grease remover will get it nice and clean. Joe, where are you? Never mind, I got this. We're gonna mask off the bottom side to keep the overspray from getting all over it. We plan on keeping it naked under there because it gives us a place to show off that carbon fiber with the hood open. And a layer of epoxy sealer is the first thing we'll spray down to act as a tie coat, which helps bind the poly primer that goes down next. This primer is gonna help us level out the surface with a couple of handy tools, one of them being guide coat which shows you where the low spots are as you sand a flat surface. It comes in powder and spray forms, and we use both kinds around here. The other handy dandy tool is this long sanding block, which we sand with an X pattern across the top of the hood. The guide coat will help us to ensure that the surface is flat and the blocks distribute the force of our hands so we don't make any gouges. Now, after some black sealer for that uniformity we talked about earlier, she also gets some black base, four coats to be exact. Once the base cures for at least 30 minutes, several coats of clear will be that cherry on top. Well, we've got the black paint sprayed on, the hood's all buffed out, and we're ready to start the installation of this giant bird. Now, a lot of you may be looking at it and may be a little bit intimidated by it, but it's not really all that difficult. But there is a few things that you should keep in mind. Now, obviously, placement of the bird is crucial because we all know whenever you're taking a look at somebody's ride, the first thing that you see when you walk up to it 
is the hood. Also, you want to place the decal about an inch or so from the leading edge of the hood. Now, that may seem like it's a little bit too close, but you have to consider the front fascia is going to add a few inches through the nose of the car. I'm going to use a small piece of tape so that I can make me a reference point here on the top of the hood because I still have to lift the decal and remove the backing from it. Now, you could use a layer pencil and mark the center line of the hood and you want to mark the center line of this little bird's tail feathers. That way we can line them up. And with that done, just hold it center here. And then you want to make sure that the placement from left to right, kind of with the hole here to the wings, is just right using that calibrated eyeball. Now I'm just using some more tape to give me a reference point of where I'm gonna to have to place this wing here in a few minutes. Now I'm gonna add just one more right here on the center of his head because it's a lot easier to have a reference point now than whenever you're middle of putting the decal on. And whenever making your marks, just use a pencil. Don't use a marker because if it bleeds through this top protective coating on your decal, well, it could mark your other sticker. That'd be bad. Another thing you want to consider is the surface you're applying the decal to. Now, we've got a fresh paint job here, so we went ahead and buffed it because it had a few pieces of trash in it. If we didn't do that, well, whenever we're trying to apply that decal, probably going to show through. One more huge benefit is to have a few extra hands, or let's say friends. If you don't have them, you're gonna to have to have the hands. Now remember, easy does it when you peel this big thing off the backing. No need to get excited and damage your decal. Make sure your hood is clean, that's a given. And spraying some soapy water on the decal will help you move it once it takes flight and lands on the car. We'll line up the marks that we made on the points and a rubber squeegee gently pulled from the middle to the outside will push out the water and smooth the graphic, getting rid of all those little bubbles. Now we're just about an eighth of an inch too far forward, but I think we're within our tolerance. Peel off the transfer paper and reveal that golden glory. Well, after a couple of days of buffing the clear coat till it's as smooth as glass, this car still has a mile of ghost stripes that have to be laid down across, well, darn near every body line. But as you can see, the old bird's really starting to come together. Today on Detroit Muscle, we're going to get all up inside it as our giveaway Trans Am's interior gets some love and attention. We'll show you how just swapping the carpet can leave a lot undone when it comes to your floor pans. Find out how you can attain the carbon fiber look on your factory pieces, learn the ins and outs of rescuing and modernizing aluminum trim, and take your hood scoop from fake to functional. There's not much left to do on our 1978 Tribute Trans Am giveaway car. After an engine upgrade, suspension, rear, and new paint, we're left with a big black bird that's nearing its completion. At this point, we just about got all the decals on our Trans Am here. But with over 200 feet of stripe, well, it takes a dang good bit to get them all on there. Yeah, but time well spent, Mr. Tom, especially with that new golden Firebird flapping its wings on the hood. I like that thing. You know, now it's time to move from the outside inside, though, and I gotta tell you, well, you know this, the interior on this thing was in pretty bad shape in need of TLC. We just pulled up the carpet and pulled out the seats and didn't find any money like we used to. But what we did find out is the floor itself is in pretty serious need of attention. So our first step is to clean up this mess. Oh, you thought TV work was glamorous, right? (laughs) 
Anybody need a used toothpick? They may be dirty and dingy, but the metal underneath is in good shape. We saw to that when we inspected the car for purchase and worked under the chassis. The factory sound deadening material is going away because we have something better. You got about all that old sound deadening mat scraped up? Yeah, just about. I think this is about do it and we can hit it with a vacuum cleaner. Sometimes that stuff's stuck pretty good in it. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, been here a few years. Like I was saying, this might not be glamorous, but hey, at least I got Tommy to help. Then we'll bust out the bucket and some Scott Pro shop towels to wash it down. There's nothing too fancy here, just some soap to get it clean. There is a small amount of surface rust to contend with, so we'll knock that out with some Loctite Extend Rust treatment. Well, all right, guys, we're ready to install our boom mat that we got from DEI. Now, the installation is pretty much straightforward. You just peel off this little wax paper and then stick it on. The beauty with this stuff also, well, it reduces the temperature and noise all at the same time. This little roller helps to make the job a good deal easier as well as keeping the mat laid down nice and flat for you. And make no mistake, sound and temperature control material like this makes a huge difference in the comfort of your ride. Nothing like brand new carpet for the foundation of an interior makeover. This we got from year one is custom molded for our TA and it's got jute backing for a little cushioning. However, before we throw this thing in the car, I want to show you a little trick that will make life a lot easier when it's time to install seats. If you loosely install some bolts into the holes where the seats mount up, once the carpet's laid down, you'll be able to fill this through the carpet and cut a little slip for a neat installation. The way we see it, it only takes one chicken to lay an egg, but to lay a carpet, it helps to have two sets of hands. Ours is a little on the loose side, so spraying some Loctite adhesive on the back helps to make for a tighter fit. Then after a few minutes of tucking and a pat down, this job's covered. Next, after some cleanup and fresh paint, the rear side panels can go in place along with the sail panels. Well, Tom's hard at work recovering the factory seats, replacing the boring black vinyl with a set of camel colored fabric covers from year one that come with trim that matches our carpet. Another little touch that'll set this bandit apart from the rest. While he's doing the front seats, I'm gonna plug our console back in. Coming up, while Tommy unloads the big red seat cover faux pas, we'll discover the secrets of illusionary carbon fiber panels. These super duper rad seat covers have performed their duty, and it's time for them to be retired from the bucket seats of our Tribute Trans Am. The factory black vinyl covers are pretty tired too, so they can go away as well. The good news is that the foam is in great shape. A pair of hog ring pliers and a box of hog rings are the weapons of choice to get our new covers in place. Hey, well, Dr. Tom finishes up his uh, seat surgery. I want to try something totally different. We use spray paint on everything from engines to trim pieces, but the guys at Dupacolor are always coming up with new ideas for new products like this kit that allows you to give a carbon fiber look to just about any accessory. In our case, this console cover from our Pontiac. You get a can of graphite metallic base coat, black top coat, and this, to make the magic happen, it's their dimensional effects template. Now the first step, as with any paint project, is to get the part clean, and I like to use this Dupacolor prep spray. Next, two to three coats of base coat for a deep graphite metallic base. After an hour, we can lay down the template, and the flatter to the surface, the better. Then two medium wet coats of black top coat 
with no flash time between those coats. Allow that to dry for five minutes before removing the template and revealing a nice subtle carbon fiber look that works for both metal and plastic. A few hours later, the part's ready to reinstall and for extra gloss and durability, you can add clear coat. Now, the uses for a carbon fiber kit like this are only limited to your time and imagination and imagine these valve covers would look good with it. Hmm. Well, all right, guys, we're ready to get started on the transformation of our bright work on the Trans Am. Now, originally, this stuff is an aluminum trim that's got an anodized coating on it. The problem behind that stuff is, well, over time, it kind of turns milky and cloudy looking. Now, I'm going to hit this with the old buffer over here to show you what I'm talking about. That's the discoloration that I was referring to. This milky looking bit right here. Now you can get that anodized coating off with some oven cleaner and a scotch bright pad. You just simply spray it on and then scrub it off. But it's pretty messy and it's really labor intensive. And whenever you're all said and done, you've got a raw piece of aluminum that you're going to have to come back and polish it pretty often so that you can maintain that high gloss. So what we're going to do is actually paint this stuff semi-gloss black to give our car that modern look. But you need some scotch bright. Have a pad or two on me. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm going to let you use two of them. Though. Oh, yeah. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to put this in a sandblaster, would you? Well, you could put it in a sandblaster, but you want to make sure to dial the pressure back because otherwise you could distort the aluminum. Well, let's stick with this. And definitely want to get inside these channels and get all this crud out because this could wind up in the paint. We don't want that, do we, Tom? That's right, buddy. The first thing we're going to be spraying on is some PPG DP90 epoxy primer. Now we have to do that because we need a tie coat, which is going to tie our base coat to the aluminum pieces we're about to paint. The reason you need that tie coat Tom is talking about is because base coat typically has a hard time sticking to anodized aluminum parts. But with the epoxy sealer laid down, we're good to go with spraying down some black base coat. Then we're gonna follow that up with some flat clear. Yes, flat clear, not that glossy stuff. Once it's cured, we've added a modernized edge to our TA's trim. Other than that big bird on the hood, nothing says Trans Am like the signature shaker hood scoop like this. Now, from 70 to 73, these things were actually functional. They'd open up and let cool, dense air into the carburetor. Of course, in 78, well, ours was pretty much just for appearance until now. We're gonna make ours open and close with this kit from year one that includes a hinge flap, solenoid and bracket, everything we need here to wire it up. Let's start by grabbing a half inch drill bit and giving ourselves a place to begin cutting. The corners are tricky, so I'll put one here too. A body saw blows through this fiberglass like a knife through butter. The initial cut doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to have to come back and hit it some more. You can use the saw kind of like a file to whittle away excess material. And you can use an actual file for the fine tuning. Last of all, some sanding helps get it nice and smooth. If you have to come back and do some more filing, hey, no sweat. Well, next we're going to flip the scoop over and get ready to mount this flapper. First though, I want to sand off the area that we're going to apply glue on and clean it up a bit. The flap needs a little scuffing as well to give our epoxy a good place to adhere. Then we can lay the epoxy down on both the body of the scoop and the flap itself. With that, we can stick it in place and we'll hold it down with a small weight plate. Well, now that the flapper is firmly in place, I've got this piece of yellow linkage attached to it and the plunger on the solenoid. Now that it's centered up, we can mark some holes on the bracket and drill into this metal tab. Now 
Now that everything's installed and wired up, we can use this little hand tool battery to see if this thing works. Looks like we're in business and we got a fully functional hood scoop, just like the TAs in the good old days. It's the day of days on Detroit Muscle. Are you ready to see our bird fly the coop? After we get the coolant system installed, and make sure our Bear Breaker CB radio is functional, we'll dyno tune this bad boy and then she'll be ready to spread those gigantic gold flaming wings. Today our TA Bandit's making its getaway. Now loaded with a lot of new loot since we started this Pontiac project, from the 474 stroker engine all the way back to the beefed up rear end. Now it'll ride on a performance suspension and haul itself down with new disc brakes. Of course, we gave it body and paint work, plus the iconic screaming chicken decal and stripes. After some cool creative touches on the outside, we did a complete cosmetic makeover inside. In fact, this bandit bird's about ready for a road run and then a giveaway to one of you lucky guys. About all we got left now is some engine tuning, bleeding the brakes, replacing those ugly wheels and tires with something new and cool. We'll align the front end ourselves, and well, what else, Tommy? With our Trans Am, well, it's kind of dual purpose. You could take it to the track, or you could even take it to a road course. And either one of those, well, you don't want to fight a heat issue. So to keep us from having that trouble, we decided to go with a four core unit that we got from rockauto.com. And while we were at it, we went ahead and ordered some belts and hoses, and even a thermostat. Four core radiators are capable of more cooling than a three core model because they can expose your coolant to more airflow, allowing it to dissipate more heat. This model is a stock style replacement, the beauty of which that we don't have to make any modifications to get it to fit. On top of that, it still has the cooling power to handle this hopped up stroker. The hoses are stock style as well. Since we opted for this Pontiac block, which makes everything fit the way it is meant to from the factory. If you are old enough to remember the 70s, you know what this is all about. Either way, I want you to check something out, good buddy. You copy that? No tribute bandit car would be complete without a radio. No. CB that is. How else you gonna know about those bears in the bushes when you boogie down the boulevard? Get for We're ready to start bleeding brakes and it can be one of the most difficult tasks sometimes and finding a buddy to help you, well, it's sometimes even harder to do. But we've got a cool tool here that you guys should check out. This is the Motive Power Bleeder and here's how it works. You just attach the power bleeder cap to the brake fluid reservoir and tighten it down to create an airtight seal with the provided hardware. Pour new fluid into the container, tighten the cap, and pressurize the power bleeder to around 10 pounds. Then you'll want to check for any leaks. If you don't see any, well, go ahead and crank it on up to 20 pounds. With the Motive system, Brake bleeding is now a one-man job. Well, we've got our brake system pressurized, so now all we have to do is crack this bleeder open, and the beauty behind that system, well, it's gonna push all the air out without doing all that pumping. Start bleeding at the farthest valve from the master cylinder and work your way closer to it. If you wanna save the fluid or you don't have a catch bucket like us, attach a flexible hose to the valve and the other end into a receptacle. While I finish up bleeding these brakes, Mr. Joe's got something he's wanting to show you. We've been teasing you guys for quite a while about the wheels and tires for this thing. They're here, ready to go on. Right you are, Thomas. Year One has introduced a new version of the classic Pontiac Snowflake wheel. It's a new version because back in 77 to 81, they were 15 inches in diameter. These are 17 by nine. You can get them in three accents, black, silver, and well, of course, gold. We wrapped our wheels with Falcon's newest high-performance tires, a Zenith FK453s. They have a unique tread design with large outside shoulder blocks for improved wet and dry handling and less tire noise. 
In fact, the only noise you'll hear with this setup is applause. As soon as you're done clapping for joy, make sure you stick around to know how to align your own front end with an affordable tool. Oh, did we mention that a celebrity lookalike was gonna make an appearance? Uh-oh, wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> hey, we're back and ready to check the front end alignment of our TA. We got this little kit from a company called Quick Trick that allows us to check camber, caster, and toe right here. Now, in case you're just a little rusty on what those terms mean, here's a little animation to realign your memory. Among those three most popular alignment terms is camber, the angle of the wheels when viewed from the front of the car. If the top leans out from the center, the camber's positive, in from the center, and it's negative. Now, caster is the angle of the steering pivot when viewed from the side. If the top of the pivot leans toward the rear, caster is positive, toward the front, it's negative. Toe is the difference in the distance between the front and back of the tires measured in fractions of an inch. Toe in means the front tires are actually closer to each other. Toe out means just the opposite. Well, now we're gonna show you how to use the kit to check all three. We know our numbers are gonna be way off on this car because we installed a brand new suspension and just left it at that. Yeah, there are a few things that you want to do before you get started, and one of them is check the front air pressure in the tires, make sure they're set at the proper rating. And second, be sure to center up the steering wheel. And oftentimes, people use a small piece of tape to indicate dead straight on. The first thing we're going to get started doing is measuring our caster, and we're going to use our cool little device here that simply attaches to the wheel by these three little fingers on the outside of the rim. The Quick Trick tool saves you from having to go to the alignment shop. Once we mount our gauge, we need to make sure the tool sits at 90 degrees. Then with the gauge mounted horizontally, turn the wheel three quarters of a turn inward and zero the gauge. Then turn the wheel back to the starting point and outward three quarters of a turn. Now, not all cars are created equal as far as adjusting the suspension. With ours, you would back off this nut and this nut here and add a shim or remove them from this point or this point here. we will actually rotate the control arm and that would adjust your camber or caster. Don't forget that you need to repeat all that on the other wheel. Now, let's check the camber. We'll turn the wheel back to the center, place the gauge on the front of the tire and zero it out. Then place it horizontally on the bracket. Now our reading says we're a little bit over one degree, but you want to note this little bitty arrow pointing up or pointing down indicates positive or negative. Your application is going to determine your specs for your alignment. If you're trying to get the maximum wear out of your tires, well that's going to be completely different than if you're trying to carve out some corners at a road course. Now to get our toe readings, we're going to use these tape measures from the kit laid across the floor in front of each front tire and make sure to lock them in place. Now we need to go to the other side, slip the ends of the tape measure into the slots of the bar. Now we can slide the tapes into the slots of the passenger side bar, front and back. And we are just about right, both numbers match. Had the front number been larger than the rear number, that would mean we had toe out. The rear number was larger, of course, toe in. The first time we dynoed our Trans Am, we got 152 horsepower <laughs> and a whole lot of smoke. But this time around should be a different story altogether. We're gonna play with the tuning a little bit on this beast, and Rodney Butler from Butler Performance came in to help us with it, starting with setting the timing. We're gonna go ahead and start with 34 degrees and see how it likes that first. The injection system needs to learn the fuel map for this motor. So we'll slowly run it through the RPMs to let the computer learn.
out of the box, 367 to the rear wheels, and 415 foot-pounds of torque. Each time we make a pull, it gains power, dialing in the fuel and air ratio. We're finding that as far as timing goes, it seems to prefer that 34 degree advance. Final totals, 419 rear wheel horsepower, along with 468 foot-pounds of torque. That's a whopping 267 more horses over the anemic original 400-inch factory engine. That ought to work. Understandably, this is going to be our favorite part of the Bandit Trans Am project, the payoff. Uh, breaking one down, any smokies in the sky or the bushes? Finally getting to feel how the engine and other new parts perform together on the curves and straightaways. So what do you think, Joe? I'll tell you what, I like it. I like the way it sounds. It's a really fun car to drive. It steers, it stops, it goes, it's comfortable, you know, and not to mention the attention a person can get in it. You know, whether or not you like these type of cars or not, you have to respect them, man, because they, they get the attention. Some lucky dude or do that <laughs> is going to be getting this thing pretty soon, too. That's going to be done for them, at least. You know, there's nothing under the sun better looking than a black muscle car, unless it's a black TA muscle car with new paint, gold stripes, and those special snowflake wheels. This may be our coolest looking project ever. And just think, we're giving this thing away. Well, that means we've got to make the best use of our seat time before we surrender this beach. By now, you might be wondering if we're going to get crazy and do a burnout with this car. Well, no. We'll probably have to do several before the day's over. Yes, sir. I believe them Butler boys knocked it plumb out of the park. <laughs> this Bandit car is a fun ride, but I'd be having a lot more fun if Tommy quit hogging the wheel. Yeah, I think I could drive this thing with more creativity. Yeah, <laughs> that's more like it, right? Real bandit. Hey, Cletus, you got a copy? Uh-oh. Wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> what are you looking at? Don't sweat it, Joe. Everybody's going to be looking at the car anyways. And soon the winner will ride away in a one-of-a-kind bandit one that was built to steal all the attention. <laughs>